Okay, so um, hi everybody. My name is Jonathan Hines. I, I'm the lead developer at Area Optics Inc. Uh, and you know we we specialize in polarization, and you know specifically uh, we develop Polar SM, which is a polarization ray tracing software that we've written completely within Mathematica. Um, and so you know it, it uses all of Mathematica's functions and is uh, you know uses the Packlet system as well. And so you know it does full physically accurate polarization ray tracing for customers in um, you know, wide range of, of applications. But one of the examples here is uh, for the next generation of AR VR headsets, all of the headsets shown here uh, leverage pan polarization based pancake lenses, which are essentially lenses that use polarization to get the light to pass through the lens uh, multiple times as opposed to passing through multiple lenses. So all of these headsets have a much reduced form factor that's enabled by that technology. So you have the a Panasonic uh, per prototype on the left and then the MetaQuest Pro just announced in the middle and the Pico 4 on the right. All of them uh, use polarization-based pancake lenses. Um, and you know, in this talk, I, I really wanted to talk about uh, you know, polarization is a, is a little bit of a um, finicky concept sometimes. And so we, like, I wanted to talk about some of the visualizations that we do for polarization and polarized rays. And then, you know, because we're holding a lot of information, um, you know, I wanted to talk also about how we deal with all of that ray tracing data and then, you know, how we bring it together to uh, deliver analysis to our customers um, and provide a tool for them as well to be able to do that analysis themselves. Um, so something that I wanted to do to start is show off some of the dynamic learning tools that we've used for both education, but also presentation to broader audiences and as a way to maybe give people some of a refresher on polarization. So here I have a, a little bit of a manipulate of a classic, you know, electromagnetic wave. Uh, we're not showing the magnetic field, so just the electric field. And right now we can see that it's polarized in the X direction. And at the end here, this dark purple arrow, we're showing a polarization ellipse through one of our uh, visualization functions, ellipse 3D. So, you know, it's X polarized right now, but if we turn on the amplitude of the Y component for the wave, now we can see that we have a, um, we have a slightly different polarization. Um, and in most cases, a lot of people think about polarization this way, of like linear along specific axes, and whether it's horizontal polarization or vertical polarization. In this case, if we turn the Y field on the entire way, then we get horizontal or we get 45 degree polarization. But in general, polarization is actually an ellipse, uh, and you know, with special cases of being linear or circular. So if we phase shift the X and Y components to each other, then we can see that the electric field starts to corkscrew around with a certain handedness and we get a polarization ellipse at the end. And here we can see that um, that's what that representation of the ellipse is, is just you looking along the ray, what is the um, phase evolution of the electric field? So with just this polarization ellipse, we can represent this uh, phase evolution of the, of the electric field. So, you know, the, and this, these kinds of tools are something that are used a lot in the classes at the University of Arizona that we have a close uh, relationship with uh, for their polarization classes and everything, where's a lot of, is where a lot of this code came from originally. Um, but we, you know, take a, a lot of steps past just, you know, these simple visualizations and do polarization ray tracing. So we have a full ray tracing engine, and here we can see that we also can represent visually these polarization ellipses along rays. So here we have a converging incoming, uh, incoming uh, beam of light, and it's circularly polarized. We're not we're, you know, I try to keep the visualization simple, so we're not showing the directionality of the arrows or the phase evolution on these ellipses. They're just, you know, uh, solid purple, but we have a lot of flexibility there. Um, and you know this crystal is a birefringent crystal, so it splits the polarization into horizontal and vertical components. So we can see that at the front face, and then how that leads to uh, polarization focusing in two different spots. Because there's you know not only does it split the polarization component, they also go and don't travel in slightly different directions. And then we can collect all these rays on a back surface, and we can see that the horizontal and vertical uh, polarizations are walking off from each other and 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 splitting. Um, and then this is also, you know, an example of, of what the meat of our visualization is in a lot of cases because we have optical systems. Uh, we use a CAD style uh, composed plot with, you know, sometimes a lot of optical surfaces. So the, you know, the control of these visualizations and plots is, in, is incredibly important for us to be able to both uh, see these concepts clearly and explain them to people. Um, so, you know, returning to these polarization ellipses a little bit, one of the most powerful visualizations uh, in this field is the Poincaré sphere. 
And uh, this sphere is essentially a mapping onto a, onto a sphere of all of the possible polarization states. Um, so you can see that we have axes here that um, show, you know, this is a common nomenclature of horizontal state, vertical state, 135 degrees, 45 degrees. And along the equator, every polarization state is linear. Um, but as you go to the North and South Pole, we get right-hand circular and left-hand circular polarization. And the handedness of these is, is really important in a, in a lot of applications, especially, you know, I, I don't know if people have experience with the underpinnings of uh, 3D movies, but um, to get 3D glasses that don't uh, change how they work based off of the angle of your head, uh, one, glasses, one glasses uh, lens filters left-hand circular, one filters right-hand circular. So the handedness of this is, is incredibly important, but this sphere gives us all of the possible polarization states of light. Um, and it also is a really powerful way for us to be able to represent things like those uh, 3D glasses lenses or crystals or anything that changes the polarization. You know, the sphere can actually change, uh, you know, magnitude as well for things that change the amount of, uh, you know, the amount of polarization, but that's a little bit out of the scope of, of this talk. But here we can see a way of representing, you know, light that's coming in with a horizontal polarization. It goes through one component that changes it to an elliptical polarization. And it goes through another component that changes it to a different elliptical polarization. And then another one that almost returns it back to uh, the original state, but not quite. So we can see, you know, inefficiencies or, or you know, slightly, slightly offset polarization changes. But we can also really represent what these components are doing in a much more intuitive way by showing them geometrically. Like we can see this this uh, this polarization component up here. You know, if we're if we're just looking at the mathematics, it may not be clear. But here we can easily see this is 180 degree rotation around the right hand circular, left hand circular axis. So you know, what, no matter where your polarization state is starting on the sphere, that's what that operation of that polarization component is going to be. It's going to take that incoming state, rotate it around that axis 180 degrees. And because of this, we can you know, visualize some really important concepts as well. So you know, this is, we have, a, we have um, one component that it has a variable uh, retardation is what it's called, or, or um, you know, it, it's a variable retarder. And uh, the other two components in the, you know, that rotate 90 degrees are, all, are both fixed. And if we combine these three components that have these purple arrows together, they can act like a completely different component, which is what we show in green, with the same variable retardance, with the same variable polarization change. So this is, you know, this is really important because you might be missing that third component or, um, you know, there's a lot of situations where it might come up, but it really, you know, this visualization shows the geometrical underpinnings of that. And even, you know, you can see even if we, we make this 180 degree rotation, um, the comp composition of these three components creates a 180 degree rotation around a different axis and, uh, you know, a fundamentally different effect on the polarization. Um, so, you know, this is, this is kind of a, a, very, a very useful tool for education, very useful tool for um, getting a better idea intuitively about what's going on in a system. Um, but, you know, returning to the, to the system plots, again, this is something that we really work with most of the time um, because we have real geometrical system layouts. Uh, we needed to have a flexible styling of plots that have many surfaces. We have a lot of control over an in individual plot 3D, and that's what all of this runs off of for the most part, depending on the surface type. Um, there's parametric surfaces as well and region surfaces, um, but we, need, we needed both a system that would combine, combine all those plots flexibly, but allow us the same kind of styling control. So um, one thing that we, we put into this is the ability to group surfaces together, and that's incredibly important for us because most of the time we're working with elements, but we're, you know, we have them defined as individual surfaces. And uh, we wanted to be able to you know, flexibly group them together and style them together. And you know we also have an we also have an algorithm that will automatically find the lens pairs and for you and and uh, group them for you based off of the materials that you define for these surfaces. But you know it's also just as flexible to be able to dictate you know specific uh, lens groups. And sometimes you might want to do a visualization where like, hey, we're focusing all, only on the surfaces in our system that are not spherical or you know any specific thing that you might want to do. You can select. A group for surfaces one, five, seven, whatever might be useful for visualization, and then style those automatically together, and they're paired. Um, and you know, the other thing that we saw is like you know things like Mathematica's grid. We have this input method for being able to dictate default uh, things, especially in dividers, to be able to dictate a default uh, functionality and then point to a specific piece of it and and override that. 
and you know we, here we are setting a specific divider to red, a specific divider to blue. So we thought, why not use this input form for multi-surface plots? Um, so you know we we implemented that functionality, and it, it both works for individual surfaces, but it works for groups as well. So um, here we can see that we set a default of this purple style, but we also were able to set the other two groups to you know a low opacity. And we could do this in the inverse case. We could set the default as low opacity and set the middle group to be purple. And this is something that lets us do what I was talking about of, you know, you might be giving a presentation and say, for this you know, visualization, we're focusing on these two uh, lenses specifically, or these two surfaces for this lens specifically. Um, and this is something that, you know, we wanted to do previously, but we typically have to open up the entire box and, you know, individually change out and replace the, the style and control. Now that's all done under the hood inside of this plot system uh, box. Um, so, you know, just digging in a little bit to how this works uh, under the hood, um, we, have a, we have a style list system that's a, you know, a, a list of associations, one for each uh, piece of, of the plot, and it has a style, but it also has inheriting. Um, and this inheriting is, is how the grouping system is done. So it, as opposed to a hierarchy system, which, you know, has benefits, we, all, we wanted to have something that was more flexible and wasn't as, as dependent on, you know, nested grouping. So we just did a simple kind of pointer system where, you know, there's no surface defined, there's no style defined for the second surface, but we, uh, we point it to the first surface. And then we can, you know, when, it, when the plot is put together, it will, it will look at that inheriting, jump to the first surface and grab the style for that. Um, so that's a little bit of how it, how it works, but we can use the stylus to do even more specific styling tasks than um, are easy to implement through options. But you can also use that to kind of hide things that you might be doing to create a really nice, complicated, beautiful plot for a presentation and only have the, you know, the output that you run that's visible, like in a presentation like this, um, be just one option. And that's passing in that stylus. So here I've, you know, pulled back that uh, visualization that we had previously, but whereas there, you know, like some simple options, we were showing polarization ellipses and ray paths. Here we've, you know, split the rays into groups based off of what path they take through the system. And now, uh, you know, I was pretty easily able to uh, color the ray sets differently, but also color the ellipses differently that are associated with them. And, you know, this, make, this can make it a lot easier, especially if you can imagine lots and lots of ray splitting, lots and lots of ray paths as things get as complicated as they can get in practice, um, being able to separate these things visually can be an incredibly important part in getting our, us to understand what's going on and getting our customers to understand what's going on. Um, so, you know, the question is now, you know, these are, these are really powerful visualizations, but what do we do with all of this data? Because, you know, polarization ray tracing, you're doing ray tracing, but you're also, ray, you know, tracing matrices and data that's associated with polarization and that, causes a massive amount more data. So um, I wanted to show a little bit of, of things that we've used to tackle that problem. Um, and, one of the, and one of the biggest engines that we've built for that is, is something called formatted table. And this is, you know, is something that we use specifically for our data types, but you know, the fundamental piece of it, formatted table, is, is kind of data blind. So I wanted to show something that's maybe familiar to a lot of people in the audience of something that is you know, a variable typed uh, data set. So you have strings, numbers, matrix, matrices, lists, labels, and then this is the kind of data that we have um, because we have lots of parameters that we're tracking at the same time. And this is a, this is a function that allows us to um, get some more, more um, flexibility in formatting this data and presenting it to a user or presenting it to our engineers. And, uh, and you know, a good example of a, of a challenge that we came up across is this list. You know, you can, if you have lists that end up super long for a specific parameter, they can make the visualization of the entire table difficult because it, it expands every single row uh, to infinity, essentially, depending on, you know, what we, what we have. And in our systems, if you have lots and lots of ray splitting, that can happen. Uh, so one of the things that we did is we put a lot of options into this function to give you a lot of control over how it's visualized. So, um, you know, we, we have the matrix form, which is really nice, but if we want to solve this list issue, then we can use uh, the multi-column function that Mathematica has built in, and that's automatically um, applied to all of the applicable pieces in your, in your system. So it's not applied to matrices, but it is applied to lists. And it allows the entire table to be much more compact, much more easy to visualize. We have other things that we've specifically tried to, to pair with what Mathematica is, is trying to do with interactivity, 
and thing and a lot of that's like things like click to copy. So uh, you know we have the ability to click any of these elements and just to highlight um, how that works a little bit. I'm also going to turn on trim digits, which is something where you know you can you can again collapse you know have a have a more cursory view where everything is a little bit more compact. But if you click to copy these elements, you're not getting the trimmed uh, you're not getting the trimmed output. Oh, uh, I think I had the wrong. Uh, I think I had the wrong thing in my clipboard. There we go. Um, if you, yeah, there we go. So if you know, like you're not getting the trimmed element, you're getting the underlying raw data. So the raw data is always there, but we're you know layering it with these with these layers of formatting. And there's a lot of you know power that we can uh, we have with this, like being able to change the representation of the data, change the limit of the pane by default that's that it's put into. Um, and you know, there's another thing of uh, just if you have you know, 10,000 rays, it can take a long time to build this table if you're building the entire thing. So you can turn off the building the entire thing and we have our own uh, scroll bar that will let you scroll through it, but it only builds what you're showing at any given time. So you can only show three elements at a time, uh, four elements at a time. So if you have a lot of formatting, a lot of data, this can make it so much faster to interact with um, because you can, you can focus in on, on a specific piece at a time. Um, and you know, just some some layers on top of that that we added for our specific data sets. Um, I wanted to use print system as an example for that because it has, uh, you know, it has uh, parameters with subparameters with subparameters in some cases. And uh, so we added, you know, info buttons that will link to our documentation. Oh, we can't see that. Uh, but you know, the, these info buttons pull up a documentation page for what these parameters mean. And we can also, you know, see this entire. This is a good example for when you might want to turn matrix form off, because we can see this entire uh, system in one screen and search through to see. Okay, this is the this is the surface that has a different surface type, and all of the sub data in that is collapsed in here. We can see this is the surface that has a different material, and all of the material data is uh, is collapsed in there. So you know we've layered layered those things on top, and what we want to do to expand this is have more column wise choice of let you, letting you say I want column two to be matrix form, I want column three to be uh, list form. Um, so you know that's that's one thing, and then this is another piece where you know we have uh, th this is something that we actually kind of you know it's a little more granular that we actually use, so it, it you know. It's a little bit harder to, you know, tell what's going on. But on the right, you can see these polarization ellipse, ellipses. This is a, a mapping of the Poincaré sphere that we showed, we saw previously into two dimensions, and this lets us uh, basically explore states uh, and, you know, a mathematical representation of those. But again, we're mirroring Mathematica's, uh, you know, what they've moved towards of of copying things uh, as as the output. And we can copy that result and put it into another analysis function that lists out essentially all of the polarization data you might want associated with this. This uses the same formatted table function under the hood, and you know so all of these things are click to copyable, um, and you get the you get the raw data out. And um, these things are make you know combing through all of the different ways you can look at this data so much easier. And uh, you know another thing you know uh, another thing that we do a lot of cases with you know with these. Uh, with these kinds of data sets up here, if you're click to copying that, we iconize it, and that, and so moving it around different notebooks is also substantially easier. So that you know, those are some of the things where using Mathematica and using the things that Mathematica sets up has allowed us to make this a much more powerful software than we we could have in, in a lot of other cases. Um, so one of the, so I kind of wanted to bring this home a little bit with uh, something that it has a little bit of both, um, and this is analyzing real polarization data. So um, you know something that's incredibly common in industry now is is you know putting actual real samples in and uh, and instead of pretending like an entire two centimeter window component does the same thing to the polarization at every single point, we actually there, there's actually machines that will take a sample and will um, you know measure the angular dependence of the polarization change the the spatial dependence of the polarization change. So you know, here we can you know visualize how the how those kinds of analysis uh, machines work, but we all you know you, our customers also get spreadsheets full of measured data that we need to be able to visualize for them, um, and then be, have them be able to use in our actual ray tracing. And uh, so you know we have plots like this that uh, collapse massive amounts of data into a very simple view. So you know like what they're measuring is a four by four matrix. 
across a pupil, so across a, a two-dimensional uh, cross-section or two-dimensional plane, and for lots and lots of different angles. So here we have a representation of each element of the four by four matrix, and each of these each of these windows is a transverse variation. So while this component is supposed to work like this first element is, is 0 0.5, the second element is 0 0.5, these two are minus 0 0.5, we can see at the edge, it doesn't quite work that way. And for some other angles, you know, if we do this actual measurement, we can find out sometimes it's very irregular. And sometimes at the edges of things, we get very different, uh, very different behavior for the polarization. And because we're using polarization dependent elements, that can mean big differences for how the image actually ends up looking. So this can cause uh, massive problems with new cutting edge optical systems performance. And so this is this is a little bit of a view of you know what our day to day is is you know trying to get to the actual um, you know trying to get to the next level of being able to see what happens in these systems and where things can go wrong aside from your you know um, ideal models and you know also be able to collapse that into a substantially reduced view and you know we can also show lots of different parameters. Uh, associated with it, with this data at the same exact time. So, you know, this is this is an overview of a lot of different things that we we've built in uh, to be able to, um, you know, do what we do. But all of them are built off of Mathematica's capabilities and the cues that Mathematica gives for interface design and for for data visualization and everything like that. And they're just things that we've we've tried to build upon to, to make more powerful. Um, and, you know, that's allowed us to make some really, really exciting contributions to next generation AR, VR headsets and, you know, lots of other applications. So, yeah, I, I wanted to see if people had questions. Yeah, we, we use uh, mouse hand, handler a lot or, or a mouse over a lot, event handler a lot, you know, these. Yeah. Um, we, we've typically we've typically um, defaulted a little bit more to buttons and and you know like that's that's one of the things with with these um, just just to make the you know because as you layer on formatting especially like you know interacting formatting it it can incur an overhead so um, you know it it tends to be nice to separate them a little bit out and and you know have more distinct interaction uh, points and so that's one of the that's one of the reasons why you use these buttons. Um, and it's also gives us, I think, a little bit more control about formatting what what comes out of them, especially because we have some types that will fill up the entire screen if you let it. And you know, you might want to rasterize it, shrink it a little bit, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, and it's easier to have distinct interaction points to be able to to be able to work with that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some stuff that's dynamic. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that's dynamic, but. Um, yeah, another thing that I, I didn't show is that you can, you know, dynamically change what piece, what parameters are shown at a given time to focus in, um, and you know that that can be super helpful because most of the time you're only looking at one or two parameters at a time, um, and you know this is this is another thing that's specific to our our functions, but that's because, you know, we don't know what your data uh, parameters are going to be, if 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 this is a function that somebody as user is using for a different data set.